What, what is time? In this channel, we've talked a lot about time as black holes warp space around them. It lays the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather. And he who controls the weather will control the world. Project Cirrus is the first official attempt to modify a hurricane. It was run by General Electric with the support of the US military. The official theory was that by changing the temperature outside the eyewall of a hurricane, which they did by seeding the clouds with various compounds such as silver iodide, a decrease in strong winds will result. On October 13, 1947, Project Cirrus targeted a hurricane heading out to sea. Approximately 180 pounds of dry ice was dropped into the clouds. The crew then reported a pronounced modification of the cloud deck, and the hurricane abruptly changed direction and made landfall near Savannah, Georgia. The public blamed the government. Irving Langmuir, who pioneered General Electric's Atmospheric Research Department and admitted that the project was about learning how to weaponize the weather, also claimed the reversal of the hurricane had been caused by Project Cirrus, but the government denied it for 12 years. After a short delay, the project officially continued, and in 1965, Project Storm Fury had targeted Hurricane Betsy for seeding. On that day, the storm immediately changed direction and made landfall in Southern Florida. Congress blamed it on Project Storm Fury, but the government claimed that the hurricane shifted before they ever had a chance to seed it. And after two months of congressional hearings, the project was allowed to continue. During the Vietnam War, weather modification was weaponized in Operation Popeye. And as a result, starting in October of 1978, an international treaty now prohibits the military use of weather modification. In 1997, U.S. Defense Secretary William Cohen said that we have enemies capable of altering the climate and setting off earthquakes and volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. And so controlling the weather seems to be a very real thing. And while the media lies to you, the government has placed gag orders on employees of the National Weather Service who have sought legal counsel to reverse these illegal gag orders and they no longer need to seed the clouds. Chemtrails, or as John Brennan of the CIA calls it, stratospheric, stratospheric aerosol, aerosol injection. injection, allows these black government projects the ability to put whatever they want into the skies. And HARP has the ability to change the temperature within the ionosphere. In congressional hearings, it was made known that HARP was a successful operation of controlling the ionosphere with ultra-high powered radio frequency, and that the Air Force and DARPA went on to develop their own versions. The Air Force has uh, gotten great value out of HARP in the past. We, uh, we, we took it over from the Navy and managed it and actually did a number of uh, experiment campaigns up there and uh, have finished our, our work that we're interested in doing up there. We've uh, moving on to other ways of uh, managing the ionosphere, which the HARP was really designed to do was to inject energy into the ionosphere, be able to actually control it. And, uh, but that work is, has been completed. Frequency transmission manipulation of hurricanes is one of hundreds of patents on weather control. With conductive particles added to the storm, radio frequencies from multiple locations can steer a hurricane. According to geoengineeringwatch.org, this happened with Hurricane Ian. This is Hurricane Ian passing near the NEXRAD transmission facility in Key West, Florida. When the transmission facilities are fully energized, they have a repelling effect on any air mass that has been saturated with electrically conductive climate engineering elements. As Hurricane Ian is allowed to make landfall, the frequency transmission facility in Melbourne, Florida is fully engaged. This effectively slows Ion's migration inland. The transmissions can diminish precipitation in some regions while augmenting it in others. 
NASA, the U.S. Air Force, is sending up canisters into the atmosphere filled with chemicals. 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 Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI. A method of seeding the stratosphere with particles that a fully deployed SAI program would cost about $10 billion yearly. As promising as it may be, moving forward on SAI would also raise a number of challenges for our government and for the international community and other geoengineering initiatives. We shall propose further cooperative effort between all the nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, and I started looking at the skies, and these are not normal. They're not natural. There's something going on. I don't know who it is or why they're doing it. All I can testify is it's not natural and it's not normal. It's got to be some outside influence doing that. I'm here to give you testimony that chemtrails, they're not contrails, are indeed real. They're spraying almost every day. I watch the clouds and watch the spraying program going on. I want to tell you that we're in very great danger from the pollution that's coming down over us. And we've been led astray by the military-industrial complex, and they're responsible for the cloud's creation and weather manipulation programs. They're dark operations. When you look up at the sun and you see a white haze, that is aluminum floating in the air right now, and it's coming from the aircraft. You want some figures? Okay, latest water test. Tested the rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. If people are finding contamination, wouldn't they come here to address it? But nothing's being done? I, I, you know, I don't know. We're, no. we're investigating this, and there's a, there's a huge concern that people are getting sick. Well, I mean, we've interviewed several people. We've been here for a week. Yeah. So... There, you're saying there is no concern? I mean, there is a concern. Many people in the county have, have told us that they've addressed specifically with you yeah. this very issue. And they're saying nothing's they're, they're being saying done. That barium and aluminum is being dumped out of airplanes because they can see it in, in, okay. in the comp okay. trails going over. Okay. Here, here's my question. If there's aluminum contamination, which is very toxic, is that something that you're supposed to deal with? in the air. It appears that there is contamination. Does that concern you? I mean, personally, it, it doesn't appear to me that there's contamination. Does it concern you? If here with Kristen Megan, who's actually a U.S. military whistleblower. She has an amazing, fascinating story that we will share with you here today. Now, Kristen, can you tell us what branch of the military you were in and what you uncovered? Sure. Um, I wa was in the Air Force on active duty for nine years, and I worked in bioenvironmental engineering. Uh, one part of that process was to approve chemicals, hazardous materials. You know, what are you using? Why do you need it? Where is it being used? And tracking that disposal. Um, after it being brought to my attention about chemtrails or geoengineering, I, I used to think it was crazy. It actually was disrespectful to my line of work because here we are trying to prevent environmental aspects and impacts um, and not have any get sick from our operations. But in, in an attempt to debunk, I it changed my life. I started noticing things. I started noticing large quantities on the system where I would approve chemicals that did not have a manufacturer name, wasn't tied to a building. When I started asking questions, um, I slowly became demonized. Um, a couple years passed after that when I asked again and people realized I was kind of being more vocal about it on social media, I was starting to be thrown into a mental institution and have my daughter taken away. Wow. That changed my life. I no longer view the military the same way and I feel like after nine years of trying to uphold an oath, I'm able to do that now. I feel they're getting ready to admit it and they're trying to sell it to us, you know. It's kind of like they sell back to us, they sell fluoride to us. You know, fluoride is a, is a mining waste product. Well, how can we make that good, you know, put it in your water? So I think that they're trying to now kind of admit it and act like they're going to start doing it. And they've already been doing it. Okay, okay, she's got the snow lit. Let's see what it does. It's not dripping at all. Okay. I've seen these things on YouTube about these the snow melting and just turning black when you put fire to it. 
I'm gonna go outside here, get some snow. Get some snow. This snow I just picked up outside. I'm just, I'm just packing it in. Here's the snow I just picked up. You guys saw me pick it up outside off my porch. Check this out. Dude, that is weird. It doesn't melt. There's no drops of water. That is weird. That is weird, man. Look, it just like turns black. You guys haven't seen one drip. In the snow on Mount Shasta, pristine Mount Shasta, 61,000 micrograms per liter. Four times the amount that is found in the soil up there. Where in the hell is this stuff coming from? But NASA is a corporation. I want you to know that. Uh, NASA has also uh, conducted a research program in what they call metallized fuels. We're actually putting aluminum oxide right in the fuel because it has two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. So during the combustion process, it releases all that oxygen and dramatically increases efficiency, but it leaves the aluminum in the air. Alex Dimitrik explains what we could see. Hi, my name is Rich Moore. I'm a scientist at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, in the United States. What is your specific job here on this mission? So I'm an airborne atmospheric scientist, and I'm interested in understanding how aerosols or particles that are emitted by jet engines in the atmosphere go on to um, evolve in the atmosphere. The people who sit here, the, the left seat is the mission director, okay. and the right seat is the, his assistant. And what they're doing is they're monitoring the power that's drawn by all of the different racks. And so they have full control over all of the different experiments, which is really important for for a NASA flying laboratory. Yeah, we're, we're trying to keep this thing as, as full as possible. Yeah. And there's a lot of trade-offs. Uh, we want to minimize, I talked about the sticky gases. Uh -huh. Um, we, we worry about particles being lost to the walls of the tube as well. We try to keep the tubing lengths as short as possible for the samples we're making. And so we have a number of different probes, each targeting a different size range. So some, particle, some probes may target, say, one micron to uh, 50 microns, and other ones may target larger particles. So mic a micron is 10 to the negative 6. Uh, so we're talking about a thousand times bigger than those soot particles that I described. And so it's a big plane. Uh, we've got instruments mounted on the fuselage, and then we also have instruments mounted on the wingtips. Starting in 1993, it was called in vitro toxicity of aluminum nanoparticles in rat alveolar macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. So it suppresses your immune system. But they also found that these same particles, once they get into your system, they can actually go through the barrier in each one of the cells. They get inside the cells, and these particles can actually suppress the ability of mitochondria which are in the cells that help to gobble up toxins and things that would be harmful to the nucleus and the, the reproduction process of the cells in your body. These processes are suppressed and so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. They say we're going to control the weather by the year 2025. I asked them, what are they doing spraying this, these chemicals on the public? I said there's a violation of United States Code 50 U.S.C. 1520, which prohibits the American government from experimenting on the U.S. citizens with chemical agents. I said that law also requires the who's ever experimenting when the federal government does it, that they have to report to Congress within 30 days. They wrote back, they said they don't know what I'm talking about. We have enough evidence that there's a spring going all, all over the place. Um, we were warned about the takeover of our freedoms by the military-industrial complex by both Eisenhower and Kennedy. They're gaining traction on us, folks. 
We're, we are in trouble more than just a spraying program. All I can say is it's about time we get up in arms about this because it is affecting our health. It's high time that we as citizens of this great country take action. Take action. The most amazing thing is that that cloud up there, which was generated by the engine, and in about an hour's time, someone in Mississippi is going to get wet washing. It will actually rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. It's raining! <laughs> That's unbelievable! Oh. NASA's playing golf! It's making its own weather!